Lauren, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Woo, the biggest week of the year, Resurrection Week. It's already here. I count today going through this uh, until next Sunday, if the Lord tarries, okay, if the Lord tarries. And uh, so we had a ton of visitors in first service today. There's a ton of visitors here. If you're visiting, we're glad you're here. And so we're not preaching the Easter message yet. We're actually going through the book of Acts. And I, I, I know it might be a, kind of a shock for some of you, but um, we have to do some homework today. Well, no, just tell us what the Bible says. We never tell you what the Bible says. Here, we never do. We want you to see in the Bible what the Bible says. And so we see that together. And then I can make some application. That's true. I'm going to help you. But we, we got some homework. Everybody ready for homework? You guys look like I just shocked you or something like, okay. There's nobody ready for homework? And you say, what are you going to teach you? I'm going to show you something that maybe you've never seen before Amen. in the book of Acts. You say, no, I've read the book of Acts. Well, I know you have, but if you don't slow down and pay attention to the rest of the word of God, you might miss one of the biggest blessings in the book of Acts. You don't want to miss that, do you? And by the way, if you are a young adult, don't miss tonight. It's 6.30 tonight. Uh, on our webpage, it's got the address. Cindy and I will be there. It's going to be, it's going to be really good. Plus, I know what they're, what, what they're going to serve for food, but some of us can't eat all of that. But anyways, that's another summer. Okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 9. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9. So don't count this as sermon time. This is not sermon time. This is homework time. I'll tell you when you can count sermon time. Okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 9. This is homework. We're just, we're just studying our Bible together. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 31. It's the last verse we're going to look at today. But, but I, want you to see, I want you to see the kicker here. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. You guys see it, right? You're looking? Okay. Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria... They had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear, the respect, the awe of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Can I hear you say multiplied? multiplied. So the church is brand new. The book of Acts is all about the church. But what you have going through the book of Acts, you have eight different progress reports by Dr. Luke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when you go through the book of Acts, when you see one of these progress reports, in other words, it's like the Holy Spirit stopping and saying, hey, look what the church is doing now. Look what it's doing now. Look what it's doing now. So this is the third one in the book of Acts. And what it tells us that the church is uh, walking in the fear of the Lord. It's at peace, edified, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Man, it's, it's, it's being multiplied. So that's, that's a progress report thus far through the book of Acts. I didn't make it up. I just read it, right? Now, if you back up the train, I said it's the third one. There's eight all together going through the book of Acts. That, that's why in, in one sense, I don't have to come up with an outline. Just look at the progress report over the years of how the church is doing. So the third one, the church is doing good. It's multiplying. It's walking in the fear of the Lord. It's at peace. It's being comforted by the Holy Spirit. And we would say, amen, 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 right? That's, that's what we want, right? I mean, overall, it doesn't mean that the whole world is rejoicing over Jesus. It doesn't mean that. It just means the church is at peace. The church is being comforted. By the way, the only one that can comfort you is the Holy Spirit. We can help do that, but no, it, it takes the Holy Spirit to do that. And then the church is being multiplied. That doesn't mean that the church is just going by church growth. No, people are getting saved. People are getting saved. The church is in good shape. So the first time you have a progress report, the first time was in Acts chapter 2. Can I see the verse? I want you to see. This was the first one. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily who were being saved. Can I hear? That's the first progress report. That was right after the day of Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit fell. That's when the church got started. And so the first one says, whoa, ho, look what just happened. And God's blessing the church. Can I hear an Amen. amen. 
Okay, progress report number two. Progress report number two was in chapter six. In chapter six, we read there, then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests, even the priests, mega, many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So the second progress report, remember Acts chapter 6? That's when they were having problems with the widows, and you're taking better care of your widows than our widows. So they thought, what are we going to do? And they prayed about it. They found seven men. Those seven men became like the first deacons or godly men. And when they solved that problem, second progress report, church is doing good, doing good. Third progress report. I just read it right there in your Bible. Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. This is the third one. Then the churches throughout all Judea. Wow. Galilee. Yes. And Samaria. Wow. They all had peace. And they were edified. They were built up and walking in the fear, the respect of the Lord and the comfort, the paraclete, the helper of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. Can, can I hear an Amen. amen. But when? Because it says then. What, what just happened in this chapter to where now we get another progress report? Church is growing, church is good, church is at peace, filled with the Holy Spirit, they're in comfort. But, but what just happened for the then to be there? Well, you've got to back up the truck because, or the train. All, all, of, this, all of this is about Saul of Tarshish getting saved. All of this is that, you know, God found him on the road. He was going to destroy the church, and then he got saved, and then he grew, and he knows the Lord, and he's filled with the Spirit. And, but to back up the context, you want to know the context of the third progress report. Oh, so Go back to verse 28 real quick, real quick, verse 28. So he, this is Saul of Tarshish, he was with them at Jerusalem for 15 days, 15 days. Coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him. That's the third time in this chapter. We'll see that in a moment. When the church, when the brethren found out, the church, the brethren, they brought him down to Caesarea. And they sent Saul of Tarshish, or they sent Saul out to Tarshish. That's where he's from, Saul of Tarshish. Then the churches throughout Judea. The progress reports right after they shipped Saul of Tarshish back home. We'll see today that Saul of Tarshish has been saved three years. We'll see today he's been to the school of Jesus, the seminary of Christ. We'll see today that he has all these hopes and dreams. He has a word from the Lord what he's going to do with Saul of Tarsus. You're going to change the world. His first time to Jerusalem in three years, it only takes two weeks. And he creates such a problem, such a stir. There's so many people that want to kill him. The church decides, ship him back home. Time out. Time out. That wasn't in Paul's head. That wasn't according to what he thought. He, this doesn't make any sense. You want me to go where? You go home. You go home. You go home. For 10 years. We will lose Saul of Tarshish. This is long before he's the great apostle Paul. We will lose him after three years. We're going to lose him for another 10. Talk about a timeout by God. What did he do wrong? Nothing. Where's his theology off? Nowhere. Is God going to use him? Yes, but don't you find this too? Don't you find you true? That God comes and he shares what he wants to do with your life. I'm going to change your world. But then, but then you walk through life and all of a sudden, it's like I'm in time out. I didn't know this was coming. I didn't know what was happening. That's why we have the Bible. Hey, God's not done with Saul, who will become Paul and will change the world all the way to Amarillo by morning what that man did. 
But I can tell you when he got on that ship waving goodbye, his heart was broken. It's not going the way I thought it would go. Have you figured that out? I mean, when we get saved, I got saved at 16. I thought, well, the rest of my life will be nothing but God's favor, which it has been, but I'll be able to watch him move. And then God sends you to time out. Don't be surprised. God is sovereign. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he doesn't always tell you ahead of time the details. That sounds like there's a sermon there somewhere. I better pray. (laughs) Father, thank you that we have the whole counsel of the Word of God. I thank you for Acts chapter 9, which is a summary by the Holy Spirit and Dr. Luke. But when we examine it closely with other parts of Scripture that Saul, Paul himself wrote, we find out that this is a huge time out in his life. And we think, Lord, of what happens in our own lives and timeouts that come our way. And it wasn't what we planned, it's not what we thought. In so many different arenas, I pray today that you would speak to us, encourage our hearts, Lord, heal us, that we might walk with you and trust you even when we're in time out. We love you, Lord Jesus. Minister to your people, I'd pray. And all of God's people would say, Amen. You know, I was thinking, there's just been so many times God put me in time out, or like the whole country put us in time out under COVID, all the different things that happen. And and I just need to explain, sometimes when we say time out, like you need to go to time out, it's because you did something wrong. I think that's still used today, like you're in time out. What? Well, go put your nose in the corner and think about it, you know, and you say, what do I do, what do I do, and all this kind of stuff. So sometimes it's for those reasons God puts us in time out. Then there's this other stuff that happens. Your, Your body gets sick or falls apart or something just breaks down, and then you're in time out for that, and you didn't know that was coming. Then there's other times you're put in time out, and you don't even know why. I didn't mess up. I didn't get sick, and you just want me to go where? Time out by God. And he doesn't tell you in advance, nor does he tell you how long it's going to be. There are seasons in life like that. I'm just sharing it. I'm sure in a group this size, I'm sure all of us either remember seasons like that or you're going through one right now where it just doesn't make sense. Well, how did this all get started? Well, it started with his salvation. Remember, Saul of Tarshish is coming with orders from the chief priest to destroy the church. You remember that, right? And he's, he's about to go into the gates of Damascus. He's about to carry that out. And then Jesus said, time out. Here I am. You're kicking against the goats. And he's down on his face. That's a good time out, by the way. When God puts you down and he wants to heal your life, not destroy your life, he wants to save you. And so there's often for many of us, there's this special time of like time out. For me, it was on a motorcycle upside down. And God would say like time out, we need to talk. And my life's never been the same. I praise God for those timeouts. Amen? Amen. But then the next one comes. He gets up, Jesus has told him, he saved him. And Jesus also told him what he's gonna do. You're gonna change the world. You're going to change the world. Basically, that's what he got. But the problem is he can't see. That was God. That was Jesus that told me, I can't see. So he gets up, and they have to lead him. They have to lead him by the hand into Damascus. Now, can I tell you, when you go blind like that, that's another kind of time out. Time out. I didn't know this was coming. I didn't know I'd be sick. I didn't know I could. So that doesn't make any sense because how can I change the world? How can I write the New Testament? How can I do any of that if I can't see? So now he's in a time out of fasting and prayer. He's in a time out of desperation because he needs to be healed. Don't we all know timeouts like that? See, when you're in your teens or your 20s, you think the rest of your life is going to be the same. But then you... In your 30s, these things just start happening to you. You didn't know that was going to happen. By the time you get to be my age, you don't even know how you got injured. You just know it doesn't work right. 
I, I don't know how, but it doesn't work right. I'm pointing to my knee because it's just like, I, I don't know. I don't know. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like, but those are also timeouts where that just happens. And it can be very frustrating during those times. And so I'm looking at, you know, Saul of Tarshish, timeout to get saved, but now timeout to get healed, to get prayed over. And then God has a special guy named Ananias. He's not a preacher. He's not an evangelist, but he's God's man in Damascus. And he comes and finds Saul, picking up from there. Okay, now the preaching starts, just to let you know. The clock starts now. So chapter 9, verse 17, we saw this last week. And Ananias went his way, entered the house, and laying his hands, he said to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received the food and was strengthened, then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And we saw last week. So that time out of like, I can't see his number one prayer, I, I need to be able to see. Well, Ananias shows up, hey, brother, God's got it be healed and scales fell off his eyes and then he got baptized so he's coming out of that time out can you see this you know and so now with this the holy spirit he's empowered with the holy spirit and then he starts taking some food some of us are looking forward to that later but anyways he starts taking some food after that fast but then but then he went to church he's with the brethren time out I'm so thankful that all of you in this room today made the decision to come in a very busy schedule, time out, and do church. Don't ever take that for granted. Don't ever get used to that. I'm telling you, when COVID ripped us off and all of a sudden we couldn't meet like this, Every time we get to meet in the room, I'm grateful for YouTube, I'm grateful for radio, but I'm telling you, to take the time out by God and to meet, that's a blessing. Because see, it's during time out where you learn lessons you would never learn unless you were here, unless you were sick, unless you got saved. That's why, in case you're visiting today, that's why we take our time in time out, not to rush a sermon, not to rush a service. You say, well, I wish you would only preach for 30 minutes. Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Maybe on Easter, we'll push it, but you know, well, if you would just preach for 45, I, I can do that. But you know what? I want to I wanna give you during this time out the same as worship. We don't want to rush that. We don't want to rush our service, nor do we want to take advantage of you. But we're going to take our time during time out. So Saul... Having come through at least three timeouts, salvation, my eyesight's back, I got the Holy Spirit, I'm in good fellowship. Man, he's ready to get going. And so, verse 20, Saul starts preaching it up. Saul preaches Christ, verse 20, immediately. I mean, it's his first week there in Damascus. Immediately, he preached the Christ. By the way, he's not having a conversation that's... Uh, Evangelio, that, I mean, he's actually heralding. He is heralding. I, I said, it's Caruso, excuse me. Caruso, he is preaching the Christ. And he's doing that in the synagogues. There's like 30 of those in, in Damascus. That he, the Christ, is the son of God. I mean, he's wasted no time. This is like the smartest guy, a debater, all this stuff. He's a young man. But once he realized, man, I was wrong, really wrong. He came to destroy the church. Now he's preaching the Christ. He was the persecutor turned into the promoter, the preacher. I mean, he just, he can't wait to do it. Like, let's go. We're, 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 I'll, I'll go to a synagogue. And can you imagine this, you know, rabbi in a synagogue? It's all Jewish. And here comes the guy that was going to destroy. He's got letters to wipe 
everybody out, and now he's preaching the gospel. He's preaching Christ. He's preaching that Jesus is the Christ, and by the way, he's the Son of God. I mean, he's just going right for it. And if you don't know anything about the gospel, you need to know this. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So I want to go back and say, hey, Saul of Tarsus, you got it, buddy. You got it. That's right. Now, just for explanation, because some people come along in the Western culture, Western, and they think, well, you know, he's just the son of God. Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. Because you don't understand the Jewish mindset or the scripture. When you say that Jesus is the son of God, you're making him equal with God. Can I see the quote by Guzik? This is technicality. Many people think that when Jesus is called the son of God, it's a way of saying he is not God, but something less than God, only the son of God. But in Jesus' day, everyone knew, everybody knew what this title meant. To be called son of something meant you were totally identified with that thing or person. And their identity was your identity. When Jesus called himself the son of God, and when others called him that, it was understood as a clear claim to his deity. He's God. And everybody knew that. When, when Saul, Paul, is preaching that, you, well, you're saying Jesus is God. That's what I'm saying. That's why in John chapter 5, backing that up, John chapter 5, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I've been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. He is. He is. And Saul that never believed that, Saul that helped crucify Jesus. I, I really believe he was on the Sanhedrin. Saul that took out Stephen. You're, you're telling me within a week, all of a sudden, you are preaching that Christ is the Son of God? Man. That Jesus? Hey, Saul, you've lost it. I mean, it's not, you're not just saved. You're a Jesus freak. You're a Jesus freak. Man, Saul, what? Uh-huh, I figured it out. It didn't take him long. Immediately, immediately. He, he's preaching the gospel. By the way, if you come to this church and you don't hear about Jesus, you don't hear about the gospel, you don't hear about the cross, you don't hear about the blood, you don't hear about how God sent his only begotten son. If you don't hear that, go find another church. Better yet, just get rid of me and find somebody to take my place that still believes Jesus is the answer to everything. Even when you're in time out. Jesus is the Christ and the great I am. Explain it. He is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yet one. I am that I am. When will we understand it? I don't know we'll ever like understand it, but I do know who my Savior is. And God the Father sent his son, God the Son, to die in my place and yours. And Saul of Tarsus got that within a week. Not only saved, but healed. Not only healed, but in fellowship with church. And now he's preaching it. He's preaching it. He's preaching it. Amen? Amen. Jesus is everything. He's everything. Verse 21, he's preaching Christ. Then all who heard were amazed. They're amazed. They're dumbfounded. They're struck out of their senses. And they said, is this not he who destroyed those who called upon this name, the Christ Jesus in Jerusalem? And has come here for the purpose, for that pur purpose that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. It's only been a week. And they start saying, man, He's blowing everybody away. Is this the same guy that was sent here by Caiaphas? And he's got the orders like to burn the church down, to take care and arrest and haul them all off or kill them. And the guy's now preaching it. Is it the same guy? It is the same guy. Isn't it amazing what God can do like that in the heart? Uh, by the way, don't ever give up on people. You say, well, this guy could never get saved. Ah, 
This guy would never love Jesus. Ah, uh, this guy could never serve God. Uh, it took him a week. It took him a week before he is lighting it up in the synagogues in Damascus where he should be hauling people off to jail. He said, you need to come to Jesus. He's the Christ, the Messiah. Can, can you see that? He's preaching it. But then, now look at your Bibles closely. In verse 22, it takes another dynamic. He's actually preaching Christ greater. Because verse 22 says, but Saul increased all the more in strength, confounded the Jews who dwell in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So he was preaching Christ, but now in verse 22, he's, he's preaching Christ greater. I mean, greater. Matter of fact, Jesus is the son of God. It's more powerful. This time he's confounding. Nobody could debate him. Nobody could win. He's confounding the Jews in Damascus. Notice it. Make sure that we know it's in Damascus, in Damascus. Okay, sermon wise, time out. Those verses are not back-to-back -back timeline. They're back-to-back -back in Damascus, and they should be back-to-back -back in Damascus because altogether, Saul of Tarshish spent altogether three years, Damascus, Arabian Desert, Damascus. See, what you don't know, what got him going in, was it verse 22? I think it was verse 20. What got him going in verse 22 um, was that he's got more information about Christ than he had in verse 21. And if you think about this, you know, time out, time out, time out, sometimes we forget there was a time out in Saul of Tarshish's life that was like almost three years in the desert. Luke's just given us a summary. When Saul of Tarshish tells us his testimony, can I see Galatians chapter 1? Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. I didn't confer. I didn't check it out with the Jews up in Jerusalem. No, I didn't confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles, Peter, James, and John, before me. I didn't do that, but I went to Arabia. Can I hear you say Arabia? Arabia. I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, can I hear you say three years? That's when I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter for the first time after salvation, and I remained with him 15 days. Can I hear say 15 days? 15 days. You have to understand the timeline. To understand the timeouts. You need to get saved. You need to get healed. You need to be in church. Time out. You're preaching it up, but if you go to the Arabian Desert, if you spend some time with Jesus, you'll be able to preach so much stronger. So much more. You need to know, Saul of Tarshish didn't get that from flesh and blood. He didn't get it from Peter, John, or James. He got it from Jesus over time in the desert. Well, I thought you'd just get saved and then you, you go for it. Well, you can go for it. But most people have to do some time out. I look at that as like Saul had to go to seminary by Jesus. Amen. I mean, you study the books of Paul. Paul himself says, this is a mystery in the Old Testament. What? The church, the gospel, what God's going to do with Gentiles. That's all a mystery. Who revealed it to Paul? Jesus did. He didn't learn it from flesh and blood. He learned it from Jesus in the Arabian Desert. Do you guys ever have desert time? I didn't say dessert time, I said desert time. <laughs> like sometimes, you know, God has to put us in a place that we weren't planning 
Jesus didn't tell him that on the Damascus road. He couldn't get out his cell phone and say, what does this mean for my life? It, you got to spend some time with Jesus, extended time. And God has a way in each one of us at different seasons of our life. We just need more Jesus. I need Jesus teaching me. I need to hang out with Jesus. I just, I just do. And some of that could be in the desert of Amarillo by morning. It doesn't mean it's always fun. But you'll learn about Jesus. And desert time is by his love, not by his wrath. It's for your healing, not for you to be afraid. It's for you to have a more effective ministry than you did when immediately you preach. Well, watch what happens after three years. Oh, man, he's so much stronger. He's so much deeper. He knows so much more than he did before. Hey, just so you know, in this church, if your kids grow up here, we strongly encourage them when they're through with you know, junior high and high school, we strongly encourage that they'll go to at least a Bible college for a year before you start working at Walmart, before you get you know, tied into Pantex, or before you, you know, get your life. Get, don't we know that once you start that, you know, it's, it's, it's done. Go and hang out with God for a year. Just go. And we don't expect everybody to be a pastor or a missionary. No, that's not why you do it. Just you need to go and spend time, time out with God. All three of my kids did that. Uh, our church over the years have sent like 140 kids to Bible college. All of our staff pretty much comes from the Bible college. Why? Because when you're in time out with God, he can use you better. Amen? Amen. Verse 22. After desert, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwell in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Verse 23, the conspiracy theory begins. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Their plot became known to Saul. They watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples of Damascus took him by night, let him down through the wall in a large basket. The Jesus freak is now a basket case. I mean, I was going to be the super apostle. I was going to tear it up. Everybody was going to get saved. I just get back from seminary, you know, in the desert. Now people in the, in the church decides to put me in a dumpster and put me over the wall. Can I tell you that was never in his plan? I thought I'd come riding in, but instead I'm blind and not come in. Well, I thought I, I got healed, and I thought when I go to, and then I thought surely after seminary in the desert, but how do you think he fell in the basket? I mean, granted, his life's being spared, but how did he feel in this time out in a basket? It's not the way he had planned it. It's not what he thought. Somehow this isn't lining up. He knew he was going to suffer. He knew he was going to suffer, but not, not a basket case. My, my lovely wife, by the way, this is my opinion. You don't have to agree with me, but the most beautiful woman in our church read scripture today. Just, okay, pray for me later. Um, <laughs> Can, can I see 2 Corinthians 11? And Cindy shared this with us. The apostle Paul, when he wrote this, is talking about when he was still Saul of Tarsus, fresh in from seminary. He said, if I must boast, I can't boast, but if I must, I will boast of the things which concern my infirmity. In other words, the things that were really, really, really bad, what I didn't know was going to go on. 
the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows I'm not lying, in Damascus, three years, the governor under Artius, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me and then kill me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. He's not saying that in pride. He's saying that, you want me to brag about something? I had to escape in a basket. And God is still God. Amen. Some of you might feel you're in a basket today. It is not going the way you thought. It might be your marriage. It might be your kids. It might be your work. It might be a neighbor. It might be this church. You thought it would be this. And it's something else. And here I am in the dumpster again. Great. But what God said, God still means. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now, just to remind you, we all read, when this story's over, God's going to bless the church with peace. More people are going to get saved. But we don't see the basket cases right ahead of that. First time to Jerusalem after salvation, verse 26. Saul in Jerusalem. Saul's in Jerusalem. He's been gone for three years. When he was there before, he wanted to destroy the church. But now he comes back after escaping out of Damascus. That's 130 miles, by the way. Verse 26, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, can you imagine how excited he is? I've been with Jesus. I'm now a Jesus freak. And, you know, I know the church. I'm not here to hurt the church. So he's so excited. He came to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples. He tried to go to church. But they were all afraid of him. And they did not believe that he was a disciple. They didn't believe him. In other words, he's, he's coming to Jerusalem and he's rejected. Time out. Well, I thought they'd understand. I thought they would know. I thought they, you know, got the emails or somehow saw it on CNN or Fox News that, you know, the persecutor, you know, is all of a sudden preaching and at least a basket story. You guys don't know nothing. And they were so scared because this guy, I mean, this guy really, he was part of what took out Christ. He for sure was a part of what took out Stephen. He burned, he, he killed, he put in bondage men and women. And I don't blame them for being cautious. But you remember how it feels if you're Saul of Tarshish and, and you're saved and then you show up? It's like, Man, I've been waiting to get back to you guys. It's been three years. Boy, and all of a sudden they're saying, we don't think so. We don't think so. Mm -mm. We ain't taking a chance on you. Remember that? That's why I hope every visitor that ever comes to Grace Church never feels that way. And somehow you can't, you can't fit here. You don't, you don't matter. We're, we don't trust you. Really? Do you remember the last time you weren't trusted? The last time you were trying to be a part of something and you couldn't and that you were like in this, this own special timeout. They don't believe me. How long do I have to sit in this basket, Lord? Can I see what Guzik says on that thought? At this point, some people might turn their back on Jesus Christ. Some people might say, I've been serving the Lord for three years, preaching Jesus Christ, enduring assassination attempts and death threats. Now you don't want to accept me as a Christian? This is the love of Jesus? Forget it. Some people could say that. I'm glad you didn't. I remember when the Calvaries came along for me. Well, even before the Calvaries, the first time I went to church, I wanted to be a part of the youth group. And I was a weirdo. Our youth group had like 300 kids in it. I so much wanted to be a part of it because of Jesus. And then when I went to Bible college, I was a weirdo at Bible college. 
They were all from West Virginia and I'm from the Rocky Mountains. And I showed up with mountain boots and all the garb and Levi's and the thing. And I was just a weirdo, but I just wanted to be accepted. And they meant my youth group and they meant my Bible college. And then when the Calvary's came along, I just, I want to be a part of you guys. Can, can, do you remember that? Do you remember that? Do you remember the first time you went to a church or somewhere? You just want to be part and you're not dressed right. You don't look right. You're the wrong color, wrong color hair. And you got rings all over the wrong parts of your body. So, you know, just, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I love our church. You are not in a perfect church. You are not. But you are in a church that's been time, in timeout many different times. And everybody in this room has been in timeout. And some of you are in timeout right now. I'm just trying to convey to you, remember how the story ends and being in timeout does not take away from the sovereignty of God, nor he's trying to comfort you and heal you in ways you don't understand so he can use you greater when it's over, even if it's 10 years. That's all up to God. Saul goes to Jerusalem, he's rejected, but then he's accepted. But Barnabas, can I hear you say Barnabas? Barnabas. That's his nickname, Barney, son of encouragement. This guy, we saw him back with, uh, with Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, Barnabas was like, he's Mr. Encouragement. Barnabas took him, Saul of Tarsus, brought him to the apostles, and Saul declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, how he had spoken to him, how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and because of Galatians, we know, for 15 days. Wow! I'm, I'm just so thankful for Barnabas, thankful that he's there, now he's accepted. And by the way, we'll see more about Barney later when he goes to find Saul on Tarshish, but anyways, that's coming in the weeks ahead. Uh, be a Barney. Be one to encourage. I thank, I thank the Lord for all the Barneys in my life. I look back, boom, 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 boom. I've had lots of Barneys, lots of encouragement, and some are in this room right now. So he was with them at Jerusalem for about 15 days, coming in and going out. But then we come to verse 29. And Saul of Tarsus spoke boldly, boldly, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Hellenists. Those would be the Greek-speaking Jews. He spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, disputed against the Hellenists. This is in Jerusalem. But they attempted to kill him. They attempted. So everywhere he goes, people are trying to kill him already. You've only been in Jerusalem two weeks. And people are trying to kill you. Now, these are seasoned apostles by this point in time. I mean, they're like seven, eight years down the road with the church. You've got Peter, you've got James, you've got John. And the greatest testimony of a man getting saved is making the biggest mess all of a sudden. Can you imagine what it was like when the apostles got together? He's only been there two weeks, and you cannot argue with his doctrine. You can't argue with his theology, but you can. Is this what God wants to do right now? Is this the way God wants to do it right now? Can you see those apostles? Can you see the early church fathers wrestling? What do we do with Saul? Because he's on fire. He's been taught by Jesus. He saw Jesus. He has this huge mission in front of him. He's still a young man. We need to send him home. Somehow it, it doesn't work right now. Somehow it, it, it doesn't feel right. He's preaching the gospel like no one's ever preached the gospel, but it's not the right time. Plus on a technicality, he's not out to win the Jews. He's been des designated by God to win the Gentiles. We'll see, you know, starting in this chapter, Peter's the one that's going to go find the, the Gentiles at first mostly to the Jews, and then the Gentiles, and God's going to bring Saul of Tarshish back. I'm just trying to say, here we go, here we go, and all of a sudden the church makes the decision, we got to send him home. 
Caesarea, about 60 miles from Jerusalem. When the brethren found out, they brought him down. They brought him down to Caesarea. And they sent him out to Tarsus. That's where he's from, Saul of Tarsus. They put him on a ship and they sent him home. I mean, it makes the basket look like nothing. I don't know what it looked like on the dock when, you know, there's the church that came down. I'm glad that they didn't buy him, you know, like a taxi or Uber to get to Caesarea. They went with him down there. They stayed with him until you got to the dock. And there's the ship. We'll pay, we'll pay the ship. Saul, you got to go home. Well, what about my vision? What about my theology? What about my doctrine? What about my preaching? What about, you got to go home. Now, I already told you the kicker to the sermon. That's when God blesses the church with peace and multiplies. So what they did was in the will of God. But how do you think Saul of Tarshish felt? This wasn't in my plan. It wasn't on my calendar. And by the way, when he went back home, he had no idea that's going to be for 10 years. Well, now I look like a failure. Now, when he was back at Tarshish, I believe he served the Lord there. We just don't know for sure what that was. I mean, that's our speculation more than anything. But he becomes obscure to the church that's really grown for 10 years. And how did that church down there feel? But how did Saul of Tarshish feel? By the way, God has his desert time. He has his time out for all of his servants at some point. I remember Joseph, 13 years. Remember Moses, 40 years. Remember David, running from Saul, cave after cave after cave. Remember Elijah, ravens that bring him food. Remember Jesus, 40 days, no food, no water. We all do our time out by God. And often when you're in it, you don't know what the end's going to be. Often it's unexpected. Often it's not because you did anything. What are you doing, God? My best plan for my church on planet Earth, time out. In 2011... 13 years ago, we had a brand new guy, 26 years old, pretty much right out of prison. I met him in Houston, Jordan, great young guy, 26. And I brought him up here to be our worship leader. And this guy just had this thing about him and a connection to me. And so we had a brand new guy standing right here as our worship leader. Chuck Smith came to our church that same, right, right now before Easter, about two weeks before Easter. Chuck Smith was in this room. He's now in heaven. And I waited with Jordan until after the service, Wednesday night, and Chuck, I said, Pastor Chuck, would you pray over me and Jordan? This kid is gonna be with me the rest of his life. Two weeks later, I had to put him on a bus and send him home to Houston. Literally. Because what I thought was going to be the will of God for this church, I was wrong. And he did some things and stuff happened and I got to get him out of Amarillo. I got to get him out. I got to get him out. Jordan, you need to go home. That was 13 years ago. And we had the hardest Easter ever in our church for many different reasons, but that wasn't just his story, but I sent him home. I haven't seen him since. Uh, do you remember I was preaching in Galveston two weeks ago? Remember that? James Grizzle that came out of our youth group, youth pastor. We sent him down there. He started a church in Galveston. I got down there. Guess who the worship leader is? Can I see a picture? It's Jordan. 13 years later.
no, no, wait, 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 wait. He was so scared when he knew I was coming to Galveston. I wasn't scared at all because I knew God had healed everything in my heart and everything in his, and he's serving the Lord again. Uh, by the way, he's a middle-aged man today. Back when I knew him, he's just a young kid. But it's like, and, and there's nothing of a lie, no, no hint. I mean, it really is. It took 30 seconds, and we're back where we left off. Can I tell you that time out for Jordan worked according to God's plan? And I'm just blessed by it. I'm just blessed. Notice what your Bible says. Notice what it says. Paul has shipped out. Well, the results, well, let me, I've got one, I got a good quote by Guzik. Can I see Guzik real quick, real quick? For his own protection, the Christians in Jerusalem sent him out of Tarshish. Somewhere between eight and 12 years passed in the life of Saul before he again entered into prominent ministry, being sent out as a missionary from Antioch from the church of Antioch, and we'll see that. It's actually the next progress report the Holy Spirit records is when Paul, Saul, shows up with Barnabas in Antioch. That's in chapter 11. Let me, let me remind you of the kicker verse, though, the results. Saul is shipped home. He's time out, time out, time out. Then, then, he got saved, he got baptized, he preached, went to the desert. Everybody's mad, they're gonna kill him. We had to send him back then. The churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. John Corson says it this way. The churches were edified and multiplied when? When they got rid of Paul. Paul, who had such a heart for the people of Israel, was finally sent out of Israel into Gentile territory where he would spend the next seven to 10 years living in obscurity in Tarshish. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you were saved 10 years ago and you had such a vision, such a desire to be used in ministry or service. You thought, I'm tailored made, tailor made to do this or I've got a call upon my life for this. And you tried. But it just didn't work out. Maybe for the past 10 years, you've been waiting, wondering, is the Lord ever going to use me again? Be of good cheer. The man who would turn the world upside down, the most important preacher of all time, the most powerful person who ever lived except for the Lord Jesus Christ, had to first experience shut doors. Shut doors. Shut doors. And 10 years of sitting in Tarshish while the Lord reworked and rewired him. If the Lord is doing that in your life, don't be discouraged. Don't throw in the towel. Don't walk away. Let the Lord, let him do his work and have his way. Go with the flow, put away your agenda, get back to basics and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Can I jump ahead just one progress report? So we saw three, the fourth one is 10 years in the future. Can I see Acts chapter 11? The fourth one, then Barney departed for Tarshish to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So, so it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And Saul of Tarshish, about to be the great apostle Paul, was right in the middle of it. Oh, 
Don't you wish you could see your progress report 10 years from now? Like, where will it be? Right where God wants you to be. I told you there are a lot of different timeouts. Be salvation, be physical, be, I need to go learn about God, or I don't know why, but they just moved me here. By the way, I thought Amarillo would be like two years, and I'm still here, 44 years. I don't feel like I'm in timeout. I think this is forever. I think, I think, I think that's what that is. But... Um, We have a guy in our church, he's on the worship team. You probably noticed Frank. Uh, Frank's the guy that plays the bass, but Frank, he looks like he's like 42. He's really 62, but he, he's acting like he's 42 because he's the one who plays the bass and he's always jumping around and moving around and he's really into it. And Frank's been on our worship team for, for years and years. I love him, and, but Frank, who's always taking care of his body, but Frank, um, Notice something like 12 days ago, something's, something's not right in here. Something's not moving the way it should be moving. So he went to the emergency clinic and they did an x-ray and they told him go straight to the hospital. He gets to the hospital and they do another sonogram and things and they find out, we gotta open you up. So they cut him from here to here and they found melanoma cancer all throughout his abdomen, everywhere. Time out. I didn't even know about that story, didn't even know about that story till Tuesday night. Because when they opened him up, they took out a softball size of a tumor. It's melanoma and it's just spread. So we had another funeral going on Thursday, matter of fact, two, and uh, so I couldn't get up. We sent some pastors up there, and it was really, really, I mean, you talk about time out, 62, and I had this, and now there's this, and the reality is we don't, we don't know God's time frame for Frank. We don't know. We're hopeful, but we don't know. He, Frank doesn't know. So I, you know, I've been here 44 years. I've had lots of stories like this, and then you kind of get geared up for what it means. And so by the time I could get to see Frank, literally the, the first chance I had to get to see him was Friday. And I already had some pastors that were there. And man, it's just heavy. It's, it's bad news. It's, it's hard. And obviously it's time out by God. So when I knocked on the door, literally Friday morning, when I knocked on the door, I'm getting ready to go in there and, and just minister. Was I ever wrong? I was wrong. Because something happened between Wednesday and Friday. Can I see a picture of Frank? I have his permission. Frank! And it wasn't like I just made him smile. I walked in. This guy's, you know, glowing with the Holy Spirit. And this guy, I'm sitting there, and he's doing all the talking. He said, Pastor, i got to tell you something. i got to tell you. He started telling about his life. I, well, I know Frank. What else? He said, no, I've been holding out on God. I've been holding out on God. And, you know, when this happened, I just, I'm, I'm giving everything I am. I am now there, totally surrender. And I, I am sitting there going like, huh, he's in time out, and he'll never be the same again. So when he gave me a chance to talk a little bit, I said, Frank, man, I, I got the sermon. It's in the box. Can I use you as an illustration? Oh, yes, you can use me. <laughs> okay, can I take your picture? Yes, you can take my picture. I didn't show you the one that shows the scars. I thought that might be too much. but I mean, you could, <laughs> And what, I'm not making it up. The, the, the guy was great. It was great. I don't know if he has five days, five months, five years, or 50. I don't know, and neither does Frank, and neither do you. But when God puts you in time out, whether you deserve it or not, or you don't, or you don't know why, make sure you're like Frank. I don't know how long, I don't know how far, but I'm down, Pastor Bill, I'm down. I can't wait till he plays the bass. It wouldn't surprise me, oh man, if he's up here on Easter. That's me talking, don't take that as fact. Because Frank might say, no, I can't jump yet. I can't jump. <laughs> I can. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. That you weren't done with Saul, you were just 
doing those things that only can happen over time and time out. It's like a tough piece of meat. It's gonna, you gotta slow cook that a long time before everybody can enjoy it. So I thank you for Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the great Apostle Paul. I thank you, Lord, for all the friends I have here and your work of sanctification in them. You're preparing them to change their world according to your time frame and your time out. How we thank you for Jesus that came at the perfect time to fulfill all those prophecies, to pay the price and empower us with the Holy Spirit. How I thank you for him. That Lord, as we share the gospels, we live the gospel, whether we're in time out or not, whether life's going the way we thought or not, that we can trust you, Lord, and learn whatever desert we might be in right now. We pray for Frank. I thank you that he's a Jesus freak while still in that basket. So bless us, Lord. Encourage us. The story has a great ending for the church and for Saul, who becomes Paul. Maybe your time out today was to hear the gospel. Maybe the time out you're wrestling with today is whether you'll listen to Christ who's speaking to you. And this time you took to be in church, this time to hear, and yet Jesus comes along and says, hey, you're the one that needs to say yes to me. You need to confess me. This time out in this church today was to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, who died for you. If that's you, if that's you, if you're here this morning and you want to say yes to Jesus, you want to be connected to him, you want to be saved, uh, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm just going to, so we can pray for you. I promise we're almost done with this service. And after we pray, we're going to close. Is there anybody that this is your time out service to say yes? Thank you. Is there anybody else? Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Anybody else? Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Father, I would thank you for these men that stand. I don't pretend to know what kind of time out they're in. But I do know this is the right time. Today is the day of salvation. And that these men have stood, not before us, but before you. So invade their lives the way you did Saul of Tarsus on that Damascus road. Encourage them, Lord, with whatever trial they might be going through, whatever time out. Encourage them that you're there to heal them in ways that we don't understand. And that, Lord, you're going to use them for your kingdom's sake in the future. So bless them, bless them. Thank you, Lord. You came to heal us, not to scourge us. You came to heal us. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege we have to preach it and to watch it work. Save your people. In the name of Jesus, everybody else would say, you guys want to welcome these guys that are standing and...